Hello and welcome to Mental Awakening, the podcast that explores all topics related to trauma recovery, mental health, chronic pain and healing. I'm your host, Sarah DeKeely, and today we're going to talk about emotional neglect during childhood and its impact on our well-being as adults. I'll discuss the ins and outs of emotional neglect and offer listeners an insight into how emotional neglect is connected to childhood trauma and its powerful influence on the quality of our mental health and relationships. So let's start with exploring what emotional neglect is and what it actually means. So emotional neglect is a topic that is actually very rarely discussed, even by therapists and psychologists, um, counselors, because it just um, isn't easily recognized, you know, it, like, for example, physical abuse, because emotional neglect is usually about a parent's failure to act, to notice, to attend to, and to respond appropriately to a child's feelings. So it's not really the fact that something happens but rather the failure for it to happen that it fails to happen and the reason to why it's so important to talk about this and bring awareness and shed light on this topic is because it it influences and affects our relationship with ourselves and the relationship that we end up um, having with others in our adult years with intimate partners so As humans, we are all relational beings. So, you know, the interaction that takes place between people is actually incredibly important. When you feel unloved, when you feel like you're not being noticed or you're not being um, seen in your relationships, a lot of that um, often has to do with what you went through in your childhood years. So that lack of attentiveness and responsiveness speaks volumes. And this is kind of what happens in childhood. We end up translating um, these repetitive behaviors as my feelings don't matter because we shut off. We're not really tuned into our feelings. So it is always a form of neglect and it happens in majority of families. And yes, most parents do their best and most parents love their children. However, it's not about love. It's not about lack of love. It's about lack of awareness and lack of consciousness. Um, Because often trauma is something that gets passed on from generation to generation. And unless we shed light on these issues, unless we bring awareness to them, it's going to be really difficult for us to understand the truth of what's happened, which is always the key to healing, knowing the truth, understanding it. And then changing certain patterns, because that only happens once we understand them. So I'll give you an example from my own life of what emotional neglect looks like. I recall a memory of coming home from school. I think I was maybe seven, six or seven, something like that, years of age, and I was being teased at school, I was going through a bit of bullying, and um, I came home and I was incredibly angry, so I threw my bag on the floor, didn't wash my hands, started annoying my little sister, and when my mom asked me how was my day at school, I was just, I didn't want to respond, yeah, I just, um, I was quite upset. So what I remember was that my mom actually called me a bad girl. She said, go to your room, you're being mean, you're, you're, you're acting really badly, you're being naughty, and so on. And I was sent to my room. So my mother's emotional inattentiveness or failure to notice or accurately interpret and understand and kind of soothe and provide comfort to me at that point um, resulted in me missing out on a really crucial learning which is how to make sense of my feelings and behaviors. I also missed out on the experience of empathy for my mother, which impaired my own ability to develop empathy for myself. And obviously, we're not talking about just one incident here. This was something that happened repeatedly. This is just one example I'm using, but there were many, several examples. Some of them I don't even remember. 
um, but I remember how I felt, both by my father and my mother, where I was repeatedly dismissed. And this isn't something that they did consciously, of course. They were doing their best. My mother was extremely stressed out. She was very busy. She worked full time. Um, they were going through some really full-on relationship um, issues. There was some domestic violence happening. Um, I remember we went through moving from one country to another. Um, there was things such as uh, financial challenges, health challenges. Um, there was all kinds of stuff going on for my parents during my childhood years. So all of those things contributed to the to a repetition of this you know, emotional neglect taking place. So the way I learned to cope was to suppress and disconnect from my feelings as a child with no understanding of them. Because obviously children don't understand their emotions. They haven't yet developed that prefrontal cortex part of their mind that can rationalize and, and really understand that, you know what, this isn't about me. This is their stuff. This is their issues. And so I became a lot more withdrawn and shut off to my feelings. And I remember developing an eating disorder in my teenage years because of the feelings of, you know, just being incredibly overwhelmed by the stresses at home, just not knowing how else to cope. Um, and the eating disorder was kind of my way of feeling like I had some form of control, even though I still didn't. So the impacts of emotional neglect are actually quite detrimental and um, traumatizing. What happens is that when we've experienced emotional neglect during our childhood, we often end up um, finding it very difficult to express and identify our feelings during our adult years. We end up having a lack of empathy for ourselves, being incredibly judgmental, critical, of ourselves and others. Um, there is a difficulty in trusting others. There's a frequent feelings of worry and excessive fears and dissatisfaction. There's a need to people please and a difficulty to say no and implement boundaries or even ask for help. The feelings of failure um, and suppression or projection of anger, including feelings of rejection, like a sensitivity towards that, pervasive feelings of emptiness, unhappiness, and lack of joy. So that's why understanding emotional neglect and the impacts of that are so important because often, um, you know, when I talk to clients or having worked within the sector of mental health for over a decade, there's a tendency to feel that there's something wrong with you or that you're not strong enough or that you're, you're not doing life the right way, you know, that you're basically failing at life. And none of that is true. Everything that we go through um, during our ch childhood years ends up contributing towards the development of self, how we perceive ourselves how we interpret the world. And so suppressing emotions and being disconnected from emotions um, has a lot of consequences, including physical consequences. It increases stress on our bodies. Um, it leads to everything from chronic pain, um, all kinds of mind-body related disorders, including heart disease, diabetes. It affects our immune system and very much exposes us to illness, right? Stiff joints and bone weakness and so on. It's also something that affects our adult intimate, intimate relationships. It's very common in adult relationships. Couples often wanting to improve their communication skills and feel like there's frustration because one of them shuts off, the other one just can't seem to stop kind of being in that fight mode. And this is largely because they miss out on these emotional cues and they kind of fail to notice, attend to, and respond in a timely manner to their partner because they haven't been shown how to do that. Um, and additionally, when one or both partners engage in 
regular emotional avoidance, they simply end up in kind of intellectual arguments focusing on facts rather than being vulnerable and really focusing on how they actually feel. And so even things like giving your partner the silent treatment. Uh, and so what happens is the consequences of that is that people end up going to another friend and talking to another friend about their partner or about their feelings as opposed to talking to their partner. Or there's a lack of clarity about what they want from each other or feeling alone in a relationship or um, not really having a desire to engage in social activities as a couple and kind of preferring to be alone in solitude as opposed to spending time with their partner. And there's also a difficulty in self-soothing when you're going through stressful times and you're going through conflict. You end up shutting off or shutting down um, or having your partner ends up shutting off or shutting down every time you raise an issue. Basically, you end up numbing out, you know, suppressing, ignoring your feelings and your partner's feelings and doubting your choice of partnership. It's really important that when these things start to show up in a relationship that you actually get help, that you get counseling and start to work on these patterns especially because they they re-trigger us yeah they kind of end up being incredibly re-triggering and even at times traumatizing again because you feel the same emotions that you felt when you were neglected as a child earlier in this talk i talked about how my parents and my mom was going through a very stressful time pretty much during the whole duration of my childhood. But I really want to mention that there's a couple of reasons to why neglect actually happens. There's everything from, you know, relationship issues, financial pressures, fighting about money, which is a big thing, or immigration, you know, moving from one country to another country, work-related challenges that parents can go through, um, you know, ill health and even cultural patterns of behavior, you know, that get passed on from generation to generation, kind of like expectations, cultural expectations. For me personally, coming from um, kind of like this Middle Eastern cultural background, there was a lot of expectation around sacrificing my own needs without even knowing what my needs were, but just I was just it's kind of the thing you do. You know, you do everything for the family, you give up what you want and need in order to meet everybody else's expectations. And it, interestingly enough, nobody actually ended up being happy in the end because no one actually did what they really uh, wanted to do or what was right or felt right for them. And, and this is a form of emotional neglect. So there's certain personality traits that um, tend to develop because of emotional neglect. There is this deep-seated insecurity, low self-worth, lack of skill in some ways because you've just spent a lot of your time trying to please others, saying yes to others, lack of boundaries, feeling guilty, um, and also taking on some false beliefs false idea that you have to give a reason for saying no. So if somebody asks you to go somewhere or to do something, you always have to explain the reason why you can't do it, or you just simply dismiss your need and give in to what they want or expect from you or what they're asking of you. And so what I meant by lack of skill is that if you've spent all your life saying yes to things, being a yes person or being a pleaser, then you're going to really struggle to know what it feels like to say no. There's often a fear of rejection. There's often a fear of what if I'm going to be cast out of this particular group or community or tribe. And, you, you know, you tend to feel that you're not as important as other people. Your needs, your feelings always come second and other people's needs and feelings are more deserving than your own. You, you have no right to kind of put your own right, um, needs before theirs. And this obviously is going to bring up some, you know, frustration, some 
suppressed rage and anger, which again contributes towards mind-body related disorders such as TMS, such as chronic pain, and, and also the guilt that I mentioned, that, uh, which comes from feeling that you always have to be helpful and willing. And if you're not, then you're a bad person, or you always have to be a certain way or a certain live up to a certain expectation. And if you don't, then you're bad, right? This is what makes this stuff really tricky because it takes time to learn boundaries. It takes time to learn to say no. It just involves a willingness to make yourself uncomfortable. The more you do it, the easier it will feel, not because you learn how to do it, but because you're getting accustomed to it. The truth is you don't have to give a reason to why you're saying no. You can just simply say, hey, I'm not able to do that. Thanks for the invite. Or, um, no, that's actually not going to work for me. Or, no, that's not suitable for me, right? Everyone has the right to ask for anything. You have a right to say no to that. And your guilt will dissipate if you understand and accept your true rights. Your needs and feelings are every bit as important as everyone else's. You're the guardian of your own feelings and needs, and you have a responsibility to yourself to prioritize them. It's something that will literally set you free if you embrace it. I know for me uh, personally, saying no and implementing boundaries was very difficult. I remember when I first did it with my mother, she didn't talk to me for, I think it was over six months, you know, and at all. We didn't talk, we didn't you know, call each other. And the only thing I did was say to her, hey mom, you're calling too often. I've got nothing to say to you. Just let me call you when I feel like it because I was getting drained from it, right? And it took us many years to get to a point today where I call her whenever I feel like it. It might be every two weeks, it might be every three weeks, but whenever I can and I have time to, and sometimes I don't call her, I send her a message and I just say thinking of you. And she does the same and she's happy with that. And it took a lot of this going back and forth, you know, her pushing back and me continuing to implement the boundaries until she realized that, you know what, if I want to have a relationship with my daughter, I have to respect her boundaries. And this is so important. And yes, it's not comfortable. It can be painful. But, you know, growth and healing is not about being comfortable. I just want to clarify that. If you're looking for comfort, then you're going to stay in exactly the place where you are because there's a part of that that is comfortable it can be very comfortable to be um, miserable it can be very comfortable to hold on to the old patterns and belief systems that we've been you know we grew up with because that's the that's the known right that's the stuff that we know and that's the stuff that uh, makes sense to us but when you're looking to change things, when you're looking to heal, and when you're looking to move away from the trauma narratives of your upbringing, you have to commit to the discomfort that you're going to go through and to get support through it. It's not about doing it alone. It's about committing to it and getting support through the journey so that you know that you're not alone in it. So how do, we, how do we recover from emotional neglect? Um, there are so many things I could say about that, but I'm just going to stick to a couple of things. The first thing is to make time to get to know yourself, to get to know your feelings, to get to know your emotions. And the way to do that is to be, become more familiar with your body. Learn about the sensations in your body. What comes up for you? How does it feel? when you give in to something that you don't really want to say yes to? How does it feel when you deny yourself of something that is uh, wonderful, you know, of something that's good for you? Noticing how that feels in the body, because the body never lies. The body is incredibly wise. And although we do have a nervous system that gets conditioned and can interpret threat incorrectly, I think the body has an incredible ability to still continue to reveal its wisdom to us. We just have to stop for a minute and listen and tune in. It takes practice. Sitting with discomfort is never easy. And so I always say, um, you know, tune into your body, bring in practices such as mindfulness, bring in practices such as yoga, 
spend time in nature, journal or process, you know, kind of get to know yourself. Okay. One of the things I love is this process called Morning Pages by Julia Cameron. I just love her. And she says that if you just sit down every day as you wake up, even if you just wake up a little bit earlier and sit down and just write three pages of whatever comes to your mind, whatever it is, no judgment. And you can't stop until you finish the three pages every day. That's all you got to do. And then you look back at the patterns of what's come up for you over and over again. Then you get closer to knowing your truth or to knowing and getting better at recognizing, you know, what's working for you, what's not working for you. And yeah, so that's, these are a couple of things. I find that connecting with your breath and committing to this one thing that you do for yourself per day can be a really good way to build that, you know, strength muscle where you just show up for yourself, whether that's in meditating or breathing. I find that focusing on your breath is even more effective than meditating and listening to something. Um, whether that's in doing something that brings you joy and pleasure, whether that's in writing, whatever it could be, right? As long as you just commit to one thing and you do it because, because it's just you, sh you know, showing up for you and doing something that even though you don't always feel like it, it's good for you. It's just helping you build a stronger connection with yourself. So in order to become more emotionally attuned and move away from the emotional neglect um, that we've experienced, we have to become more aware of our own emotions. Learn how to attend to, how to respond to, how to show up understand, provide comfort and soothing for ourselves through self-compassion. And this is a practice. Again, you know, all of this stuff is practice. Our whole lives is a practice of this stuff. But we get better at it, right? We get better at the soothing. We get better at the comforting. And that's where the reparenting comes in. And so I'm going to save that one for another episode. Um, the whole reparenting process and what that involves. Uh, but I'm just going to leave it there for now, guys. Uh, this is my first attempt uh, creating a podcast. So please bear with me as I navigate my way through the podcast world. If you have any questions with regards to today's session, or um, if you have any suggestions with regards to future episodes, please feel free to email me on sarah at mentalawakening.com.au. And yeah, I look forward to talking to you guys next time. Thank you so much for listening and take care. Bye, everybody.